slightly differently. So I remind you that uh, antimatter was postulated by uh, Dirac in the 1920s. He was trying to combine quantum mechanics with special relativity. And he predicted the existence of these particles with equal and opposite properties for regular particles, equal masses, but, for example, opposite electric charge. And in the 1930s, the first antimatter particle, the positron, was discovered in cosmic rays. And now they're studied routinely in accelerators, uh, used in medical diagnosis, and so on. I came as a big surprise, actually also in 1964, when an experiment showed that matter and antimatter are actually not quite equal and opposite. At least their weak interactions are slightly different. And it was suggested by the Russian physicist Nakharov that this might explain why in the universe today there is matter but no large amounts of antimatter. And there are experiments at the LHC uh, which are trying to study this matter-antimatter difference and maybe make a connection with this cosmic matter-antimatter asymmetry. So this connection was suggested by Russian physicist Sakharov in 1967. And he said, well, uh, okay, you've got these differences between matter and antimatter that we've observed in the laboratory. Uh, in unified theories, there are interactions that create matter. In the early universe, we have a breakdown of thermal equilibrium. So those three conditions would enable you, potentially, to create a matter-antimatter asymmetry. Uh, by the way, this is a picture of Sakharov in about 1990 when he came to visit CERN to uh, look at the earlier generation of experiments that we were doing. Anyway, one of the objectives of the LHCB experiment at CERN, also experiments elsewhere, Japan, for example, is to study this matter and matter difference and see whether we can establish a connection with the cosmological matter and matter asymmetry. So I talked about a couple of cosmological issues. Uh, here is a summary of the uh, early history of the universe. So uh, atoms came into existence when the universe was about 300,000 years old. Before then, no atoms, no chemistry, no biology, only physics. <laughs> it gets worse. Nuclei only came into existence when the universe was about three minutes old. So before then, no nuclear physics. Protons and neutrons didn't come into existence until the universe was about a microsecond old. Before then, there were only the fundamental particles of the standard model. And when the universe was less than one picosecond old, they didn't have any mass. If I think back to my snow analogy, when the universe was less than a picosecond old, it was too hot for the snow field to settle. So there was not this universal snow field uh, giving massive to particles. So dark matter perhaps appeared sometime between an age of one microsecond and one picosecond. The matter-antimatter difference was maybe imprinted when the universe was about one picosecond old. So you know, with experiments at the LHC, we're somehow addressing these fundamental cosmological issues, as well as trying to address issues in particle physics, the understanding model. So before discussing the LHC experiments, I can't uh, not mention Einstein again, who he is. A bit of a kid, looking a little bit depressed. <laughs> uh, maybe because he had a premonition that he was not going to be able to construct a unified theory of the fundamental interactions. So this is his last blackboard. Unfortunately, he did not have a unified theory. But one of the ideas that he worked with was the idea that there might be additional dimensions in space. This is an idea which is very uh, fashionable nowadays too example of string theory. So in some theories with extra dimensions, it is possible that gravity might become strong at the LHC energy scale, in which case you might be able to make microscopic black holes by colliding photons at the LHC. So this is all piling space
speculation upon speculation, and it led to the further speculation that maybe those black holes would eat up the planet. Well, so far so good. <laughs> of course, the theory that said these things might exist also said that they would vanish instantaneously and there wouldn't be any danger to anybody. But, uh, this generated a lot of publicity for CERN, a lot of very bad publicity. I think it all goes to prove that actually there is no such thing as bad publicity. <laughs> so uh, here is the LNC. We're down the LNC tunnel, 27 kilometers in circumference, 100 meters underground. And uh, here you see some of the LNC fragments. So uh, there are plenty of protons around. So they collide. Uh, energy is eventually up to 7 TeV each, uh, making million collisions per second. Uh, also, by the way, colliding uh, lead nuclei, although I won't discuss that in great detail. Anyway, so in these experiments, we help not only to understand the origin of mass, but also the nature of dark matter, its matter antimatter difference, the nature of the plasma that filled the universe when it was a fraction of a second old, and so on. So as I mentioned, there are four places around the ring where there are big experiments. And uh, Taiwan is involved in uh, <coughs> two of those, in uh, the Atlas and CMS experiments that actually discovered the Higgs boson last year. So uh, these are <coughs> images of the uh, ellipsi experiments while they're under construction. Uh, so this is Atlas, CMS, and we're looking for dark matter as well as the Higgs boson. This is ellipsi B dedicated matter-antimatter experiment. And up here we have Alice, which is colliding primarily heavy nuclei to look for the plasma that filled the universe. It was a fraction of a second old. So I think that George Hu has already told you a lot about the Higgs discovery, and I won't obviously go into the same amount of detail as him, but let me just uh, recall some aspects of what went into the discovery of the Higgs boson. So, how is the thing actually produced? Well, uh, actually there's a, a number of different mechanisms. Uh, it may be produced by collisions of gluons inside the proton, or by collisions of W bosons, radiated by protons, or it might be produced in association with a W or Z boson, or it might be produced in association with a top anti top quark pair. Now, we are very fortunate that the mass of the Higgs boson is around 125 GeV. Does that mean that all these mechanisms, also some others, are potentially observable and measurable? How does it decay? Well, uh, couplings of the Higgs boson to other particles are proportional to their masses. So other things being equal, it would decay into the heaviest things it can. So for example, if it weighed 300 GeV, then it would spend essentially all its time decaying into W bosons and Z bosons, as originally calculated by Peter Higgs. But then we get actually very little detailed information about the particle. We're actually somewhat fortunate. The mass is somewhat lower. And uh, this means that many other decay modes are also important. Uh, in particular, loop quantum corrections, <coughs> which actually give rise to the coupling of gluons to the Higgs boson and to the decay of the Higgs boson into two photons, something that we calculated in our paper back in 1975. So we are doubly fortunate. Not only can we observe many different production modes for the Higgs boson, but we can also observe many different decay modes. So, has the Higgs boson finally been discovered? So there was an, an outbreak last July in the particle physics community of what can only be described as a mass hysteria. And this was triggered by the observation by both 
CMS and Atlas collaborations of interesting events. Here's one example from Atlas. So in the computer simulation I showed earlier on, they decayed into four charged particles, energetic charged particles. And here's an example of that. Two energetic charged particles going up there, the straight red lines, two more going down there. This is exactly the sort of thing that you'd expect a Higgs boson to do. This is an example from the CMS experiment. Uh, I mentioned the coupling of the Higgs into gamma gamma. So the Higgs might decay into two energetic photons. And that's what you see here. No charged particle, but two blobs of energy, those blobs of energy uh, could have been produced by the decay of the Higgs into gamma gamma. So it was on the basis of that that uh, on July the 4th last year, the Atlas and CMS collaborations announced the discovery of a new particle. Uh, yes, actually, these people were not celebrating the discovery of the Higgs boson. And in particular, she wasn't celebrating because her, her team was beaten. I need you to guess who's team one. This is the real. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'd like to pay tribute in particular to uh, Lynn Evans, whom you see here, who is the guy who, more than anybody else, was responsible for the construction of the LHC that made uh, this discovery possible. And uh, I like this picture because this is actually the first time when Higgs and Mondlayer met each other. Written their papers in 1964, but 48 years later in the CERN Auditorium was the first time they met. And uh, they had something to talk about. They were smiling, and I guess they're going to be smiling also uh, in Stockholm on the 10th of the 10th. <coughs> so, this is a little animation that uh, shows how the Higgs signal has grown over time. So this is well-known particle, the Z particle. This is a background, pairs of W particles. So pairs of Z particles. And here, there's a, an extra bump sitting in the middle. And that extra bump is the Higgs boson. Well, I should say the Higgs boson. That is a Higgs boson. And uh, there it is. Uh, it always looks more convincing when you put a histogram under the data points. So this is a summary of the uh, current situation combining the Atlas and CMS experiments. So here, what you see is the signal minus the background. So clearly there's nothing over here, nothing over there. So no Higgs boson in that mass range, no Higgs boson in that mass range. But if we remove the blind, then we see here a highly significant peak, many, many, many standard deviations. There is a particle. The only question is whether it's the Higgs boson <laughs> finally emerging from the background. So I'm supposed to be talking about physics beyond the Higgs boson. So let me talk about one thing that at least convinces me that there has to be something beyond the field. And that is mass. So the, the Higgs with its mass, if you calculate the theory and you try to extrapolate to high energies, you have a problem. The problem is that the uh, effective Higgs potential, the uh, what the uh, the Mexican hat, if you like, has an instability. And that instability is driven by the top quark. And this picture here shows you the scale, the energy scale at which that instability sets in. I don't know why that font changed. So there's an instability somewhere around 10 to the 10 to the 13 GeV. Unless you put in new physics. And one example of that new physics 
is supersymmetry, and I'll come back to that later on. So this is a bit more detail. On the horizontal axis, we have the mass of the Higgs. The vertical axis, the mass of the top quark. The top quark is generating this instability. And here we have a zoom on the experimentally preferred range. So over here is the region, region of stability. So if the top quark mass had been less, and the Higgs boson had been heavier, then our vacuum would be stable. Nothing to worry about in the future of the universe, except global warming. But with this value of the Higgs mass, with that value of the top mass, we are probably in this region over here where the theory is unstable and we need new physics in order to stabilize the theory. So that's within the standard model. Of course, we should you know, make sure that it really is the standard model. If it's not the standard model, then you know, there's other new physics. So uh, I like to compare particle physics to a jigsaw puzzle, where after decades working on this jigsaw puzzle, eventually you find a piece of broken cardboard. And the question is, does this have the right shape? Does it have the right size to fill that missing place in your jigsaw puzzle? Now, there's a lot of discussion going on, as I mentioned earlier on, as to whether this Higgs boson is truly an elementary particle or whether it's maybe a composite particle rather like that snowflake. So if it's an elementary particle, then there are problems when you try to calculate quantum loop corrections, problems that could be solved with supersymmetry. On the other hand, maybe it's like that snowflake, maybe it's like uh, BCS superconductivity, where the symmetry breaking order parameter is composite. Uh, and people came up with ideas with composite Higgs bosons. Initially, those ideas seem to be incompatible with the precision electroweak data, but more recently, theorists have been more creative and they've come up with ideas, basically ideas in which the Higgs looks a lot like the uh, pion of conventional strong interactions. So I won't go through the details of the construction of those theories. It's a common feature of them that they would predict that in addition to the Higgs boson itself, there would be additional new particles potentially accessible to the uh, LEC. So what are the data tasks? So this is a uh, figure taken from a paper that I wrote earlier on this year with my uh, PhD student, Tivon Yu. So what we did was we took the measurements by the ACTUS collaboration, the CMS collaboration, and also experiments at the Fermilab, and we analyzed what they were telling us about the couplings of the Higgs to the BD bar, tau tau, gamma gamma, w w, and so on. And see that all of these are consistent with the standard model corresponding to unity here. And if you combine everything together, then that agreement is at the level of, well, almost 10%. So there's no obvious indication of any deviation from the standard model. Smiling. <laughs> So this is how that picture builds up as you look at the various different final states. So this is uh, measurements or limits on Higgs decaying into BD bar. This green star, by the way, that corresponds to the standard model prediction in which the coupling to bosons and the coupling to fermions is normalized to unity. But you could ask, well, maybe it does couple to those particles, but with couplings which are, which are different. This is the information about coupling to tau plus tau minus, gamma gamma, ww, zz. And then finally, this is what happens when you combine everything. So what you see is this bright spot here, that's what the data prefer. 
and they're actually very close to this kind of model prediction. Too bad for some of these competent models. Bad for that model, bad for that model. These two models over here, they would be compatible with the data as long as they are tuned to give parameters very close to the standard model prediction. So, no evidence there of any deviation from the standard model. But we try to do a different fit. Remember that the Higgs couples to other particles proportional to their mass. So we tested that idea. We did a fit with couplings proportional to the mass of the power 1 plus epsilon. So the standard model, that corresponds to epsilon equal to 0. That's the red line. The dashed line is our best fit. The dotted line is the 1 sigma excursion. Again, everything is very consistent with the standard model. And that's why we wrote in our paper that uh, this particle walks and quacks like the Higgs boson. So this is a uh, picture of Peter Higgs in his uh, press conference. And uh, the uh, Swedish Academy, in providing the information about the discovery, wrote, today we believe that beyond any reasonable doubt, it is a Higgs boson. That quotation was actually taken in our paper. But as I mentioned to people at Pascos this morning, the irony is that quotation appeared in the preprint version of our paper. But then the referee told us to take the statement out because it was not a scientific judgment. <laughs> So this statement does not appear in the published version of our paper. Nevertheless, beyond any reasonable doubt, it is a Higgs boson. <laughs> so without the Higgs boson, there wouldn't be any atoms, because electrons would run away at the speed of light. There wouldn't be any heavy nuclei, because quarks would be massless. Weak interactions would not be weak. Uh, life would be impossible. Everything would be radioactive. So the existence of the Higgs boson is unquestionably a big deal. But is it the only big deal? Or is there something else out there, something else that we might discover at the NHC? <coughs> so people who know my research interests will not be surprised that I believe, yes, there is something else out there. And I think the best candidate for that is supersymmetry. And uh, here I've written Supersymmetry in the largest possible font that will fit on the slide. <laughs> and I would argue that the circumstantial indirect evidence for supersymmetry has strengthened over the last year. <coughs> because in supersymmetry, you can predict the mass of the Higgs boson, and you predict that it weighs less than 130 GeV. Correct. And in simple models, we also predict that the coupling should look like those of the standard model. Correct. And of course, you also explain dark matter, naturalness, guts, string, etc., etc. So, I was asked at lunch, you know, whether I'm still sticking to supersymmetry. The answer is yes. However, the experiments have not found supersymmetry. And uh, this shows you how the constraints are now. So these, this is a combination of constraints from the uh, Atlas experiment, looking for those missing energy events. And they don't see missing energy with jets. They don't see missing energy with leptons. They don't see missing energy with anything, pretty much. And uh, so those are the constraints on supersymmetric theories. So uh, a group of us, uh, for some years now, we've been putting together in a global fit all the available constraints on supersymmetry coming from uh, observations of rare B decays, from uh, dark matter, from the LHC, etc. And uh, currently, this is our best estimate of what at least the parameters of a simple supersymmetry model might be. 
uh, the green star is the best fit. The red contour, that's the 68% confidence level region. And the blue contour, that's the 95% confidence level region. So if I translate that into the mass of a typical supersymmetric particle, in this case, the Gluino, uh, well, it doesn't have a low mass, that's for sure. But uh, we can't really be sure how high the mass might be. So, so what are the prospects for discovering Gluinos in the future at the LHC? So the LHC has only been operating for barely two years, at barely a half of the design energy. It's going to double the energy in 2015. The total amount of collisions is going to go up by a factor of 100, and eventually we should be able to reach out to something like 3,500 3, GeV. This is a similar analysis for the mass of the squark, the symmetric partner of the quark. Again, the LHC experiments will push out to much larger masses. However, now, it could be that uh, the supersymmetric particles are even heavier. And it could be that uh, eventually uh, we would want to build a heavier accelerator. Even if the supersymmetric particles are light, if you have a higher energy accelerator, then you can produce more of them and study more properties. So one of the things that we're starting to think about at CERN now is the possibility of uh, making a large tunnel Larger, even larger, tremendously large uh, 80 to 100 kilometers in circumference, which would uh, go around the city of Geneva. And in that, you could do high energy electron positron collisions, or you could go to very high energy proton proton collisions. So that brings me to the end of uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, I'd just like to finish with uh, a little anecdote. So in 1982, Mrs. Uh, Thatcher came to visit CERN. She was the Prime Minister at the time. She's the one on the right. <laughs> with the handbag. <laughs> what do you do, young man? <laughs> I said, well, uh, I'm a theorist. My job is to think of things in the experiments to look for, and that I hope they find something different. <laughs> now, Mrs. Thatcher, of course, she liked things to be the way she liked them to be. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be better, young man, if they found what you predicted? Well, I tried to convince her that if all that the experiments do is found exactly what we predicted, then we're not going to be learning so much. So in the same spirit, I hope that the Higgs boson that's being discovered is not exactly the Higgs boson of the standard model. And I also hope, dare I say, I expect that there will be some physics beyond the standard model to be discovered by the NHC. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, John, for that very nice uh, uh, lecture. But well, before I open up that question, I just uh, want to mention a few more uh, other things. So during the talk, you know, uh, John mentioned uh, Maxwell uh, and uh, Dirac, these great names. Uh, in fact, uh, John uh, has been awarded the uh, Maxwell Medal, uh, Dirac Medal from the Institute of Physics uh, of uh, Great uh, uh, Britain. Uh, he has, uh, you, have, you can also see many of the works that has his uh, sort of uh, uh, hands-on uh, he has uh, really done a lot of uh, work on uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, the particle physics uh, in the past uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, he has authored, uh, uh, I think it's uh, 1,000 papers, has a lot of uh, collaborators all over the uh, world. Uh, so uh, if you're looking for citations and the edge index, uh, if you read John's numbers, I think it will be just uh, maybe quit the physics. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, for younger guys can still continue uh, to ask uh, more harder questions, and uh, maybe you will have a better chance to over uh, take a jump. Okay, so now we open for um, questions. <laughs>